Bom dia, eu sou Carlos Altschuk, professor da Universidade de Brasília e coordenador do Laboratório de Antropologia da Ciência e da Técnica, e esse é o segundo seminário Transtec, Transformações Técnicas em Perspectivas Locais. Espero encontrar vocês bem e com saúde nesse momento sombrio, que tem sido especialmente trágico no Brasil. Até mesmo por isso, agradeço muito a vocês que, apesar de tudo, encontraram tempo e energia para participar desse evento. Não trataremos aqui diretamente das severas consequências sanitárias, políticas e econômicas da pandemia que nos atingem em escala planetária, mas, de certo modo, falaremos das suas causas. Ainda que a origem do SARS-CoV-2 seja controversa, sabe-se que o tipo de fenômeno biológico que temos vivido nesses tempos decorre de um modelo de relação com animais, com plantas e o ambiente de modo geral que se baseia numa visão estrita da tecnologia. Uma das diversas formas de pensar, de resistir ou mesmo de reagir a esse cenário nos parece ser apresentar e refletir de maneira sistemática sobre outras maneiras de se estabelecer um vínculo com o que se costuma chamar de natureza. Vínculos esses que apontam para uma diversidade técnica, com suas transformações e resiliências contemporâneas. Essa agenda, que a cada dia parece mais urgente, orienta há quase uma década um programa coletivo de pesquisas coordenado pelo Laboratório de Antropologia da Ciência e da Técnica, que focaliza o seu interesse etnográfico nas relações técnicas com o objetivo de compreender e sistematizar a variedade das formas de convivência entre humanos e não humanos. Inúmeros trabalhos acadêmicos, livros, artigos, ensaios fotográficos e filmes resultam dessa iniciativa. A primeira versão do seminário Transtec, ocorrida em Brasília em 2015, discutiu criticamente a concepção unilinear, utilitarista e, por vezes, determinista sobre a relação entre tecnologia e transformação. Com base na comparação entre várias situações etnográficas, foram debatidos naquele evento conceitos e métodos que permitem traçar outras conexões entre as escalas sociohistórica, cultural ontológica e pragmática dos processos técnicos. Os resultados estão publicados no livro Técnica e Transformação, Perspectivas Antropológicas. Esse segundo seminário Transtec deriva de um desdobramento dos interesses iniciais de pesquisa, que são focalizados agora na relação entre técnica e vida, especialmente nas suas implicações e nos desafios etnográficos aí implicados. O pressuposto básico desse evento é que a biodiversidade corresponde a uma tecnodiversidade, cujo modo de existência merece a atenção das ciências humanas e da antropologia em particular. Por um lado, no cenário de grande apreensão global, nos parece necessária a tarefa de demonstrar com pesquisas de campo que as ações humanas podem não apenas destruir ou desestabilizar, mas também participar, valorizar e promover a emergência e a manutenção de contextos tecnobiodiversos de convivência entre as espécies. Por outro lado, como costuma acontecer na antropologia, esse esforço baseado na etnografia pode nos levar a reflexões e contribuições no debate mais amplo sobre a relação entre os humanos e o ambiente. Eu tenho a grande satisfação de coordenar esse evento em parceria com Guilherme Moura Fagundes, pós-doutorando da Universidade de Brasília. Quero agradecer a ele, à comissão organizadora e a todas as pessoas e instituições que tornaram esse encontro possível. Desejo um ótimo evento para todas e todos e passo a palavra para o Guilherme. Obrigado, Carlos. Bom dia a todas e todos. Eu reitero as palavras do Carlos no tocante ao luto coletivo que estamos vivendo. Também presto minhas condolências às famílias de mais de 250 mil vítimas diretas da pandemia, além de tantas outras que por essa razão também sofrem nesse momento. A todos vocês eu gostaria de deixar expressa minha profunda solidariedade. Bom, antes de apresentar os nossos conferencistas de hoje, eu preciso acrescentar algumas informações operacionais que nos ajudarão a aproveitar ao máximo o seminário. É importante dizer que o evento é completamente livre e gratuito, acessível a todos pela internet e que ele possui um formato de workshop, cujo objetivo consiste na elaboração de um livro coletivo. Para isso, teremos conosco pesquisadores de sete países e doze instituições brasileiras. Eles e elas estão distribuídos em três conferências, e quatro sessões de trabalho que buscam fazer avançar a compreensão sobre o caráter dinâmico do vegetal, sobre as variações na convivência com os animais, 
sobre o papel da caça na atualidade e, por fim, sobre a relação entre técnica, espaço e ecologia. A programação completa pode ser encontrada no nosso website, cujo link está na descrição desse vídeo. Justamente em razão desse formato de workshop, durante as conferências nós teremos dois tipos de interação. De um lado, através de uma sala da plataforma Zoom, estão presentes os conferencistas, seu tradutor, além de palestrantes, moderadores e debatedores das sessões de trabalho. Os demais poderão nos acompanhar pelo YouTube, inclusive podendo fazer perguntas pelo chat. As nossas três conferências serão proferidas em inglês e terão legendagem para o português. No final das exposições, nós sempre teremos um pequeno espaço para perguntas e debate, que contará com tradução consecutiva. Para esta conferência de hoje, de abertura, nós temos a honra de contar com uma dupla de antropólogos que nos darão um panorama do potencial e das formas de imbricação entre técnica e vida. Apresento a vocês nossos colegas, Perique Pitru e Ludovico Pai, nomes de grande importância nesse campo e que possuem pesquisas etnográficas aprofundadas junto a comunidades indígenas do México e da Papua Nova Guiné, respectivamente. Perig é pesquisador do CNRS, associado ao Laboratório de Antropologia Social do Colégio de France, onde ele lidera a equipe Antropologia da Vida. Já Ludovic é professor associado no Departamento de Antropologia da University College London, onde leciona e realiza pesquisas sobre antropologia da técnica e tecnologia. Ambos possuem diversos escritos, orientam pesquisas e já organizaram eventos importantes sobre o tema do nosso seminário. Convido vocês, então, a acompanharem as suas exposições, que juntas terão a duração de uma hora. Logo na sequência, nós teremos um debate com a presença desses dois autores que são fundamentais para o tema deste evento. Com isso, ao lado do Carlos, eu dou a abertura oficial ao nosso seminário e desejo uma excelente conferência a todos e todos. First of all, I would like to thank Carlos Sochuk and Guillermo Moura for their invitation to participate in such an interesting conference and to have the opportunity to present with Ludovic Coupay the productive dialogue established between the anthropology of life and the anthropology of techniques. If biology is the science of life, What is the object of the anthropology of life? I will suggest a first answer. Anthropology of life is a comparative investigation on the conception of life in their social technical context. Life is not at all a new research topic for anthropology. Many classical approaches try to better understand the cultural variation of the perception and the conception of vital processes, such as generation, growth, decay, health, death, biodiversity, and so on. The multiplication of new approaches in the last decades runs the risk of an atomization. I contend that we should engage an epistemological endeavor in order to organize this field. The aim is not to elaborate an universal conception of life or to defend my theory, but to articulate a vast array of empirical data and conceptual frameworks. Didier Fassin is one of the first to tackle this issue in a paper published in 2006 and later in his book La Vie Mode d'Emploi Critique, he explains how an integrative anthropological approach should be able to investigate the biological and the biographical dimension of life. After Canguilhem, he claims that fieldwork investigations should understand better le vivant et le vécu, the living and the lived through an approach which combines the methodology of the STS and the methodology of the anthropology of biopolitics and forms of life. 
the books of Adriana Petrina and Joan Bill are presented as good example of this kind of approach. In my view, this is not enough. A comparative approach should also be able to integrate the field of the ethnology of non-Western societies. As you can see on this slide, very important theoretical elaborations are based on ethnographic fieldworks in traditional societies. Then, we should try to define a comparative framework able to articulate three fields of the anthropology. First, I would like to show that anthropology of techniques gives very interesting insights for a comparative method. This methodological proposal is based on an ethnographic investigation I have been conducting for 20 years among Amerindian populations of Mexico. In order to compare conception of life in different societies, I have developed a pragmatic approach to describe the actions made by humans to interact with vital processes. This is why the anthropology of techniques is so useful, as we can define it as the study of the coordination of agency between human and non-human agents, between living beings and artifacts. This is not just a personal approach. It is a research program we develop with the team Anthropology of Life I have created at the Collège de France. With the members of this team, we have organized more than 30 workshops and conferences and published a dozen of books and special issues on the relation between life and technique. In addition to the uh, investigation on traditional societies and Western biotechnology, we try to develop transversal approaches in the wake of the conference of living beings and artifacts we organized with Ludovic Coupaille at the Musée du Quai Branly. And for instance, we have just published a special issue of technique and culture on the topic of biomimicry. I will not try to summarize this collective work. You can discover the list of our activities and projects in our website. Today, in the wake of Marilyn Strasser's work, I would like to defend this idea. In addition, in addition to the research of, on Western biotechnology, the ethnology of non-Western societies provides an empiric empirical data, concepts and methodology very useful for the anthropology of life. Indeed, as it is well known, Marilyn Strasson uh, use concept and methodology from her ethnology of Melanesia to engage a comparison to analyze new biotechnology in the US. And in, in very famous uh, book, uh, two books, in fact, in uh, uh, 1982, she uh, explained how uh, technical interventions on vital processes are um, changing conception of life and nature, but also social organizations in uh, the UK. In order to shed light on the relation between techniques and life, I will scrutinize two kinds of issues related to two traditions of the anthropology of techniques. First, technique of domestication and interaction with living beings leads us to question the relations, both technical and social, that humans establish with living beings. Secondly, investigations on material culture led us to question the relations between living beings and artifacts. To begin, I will show why is it fundamental to establish a clear distinction between life and the fact of being alive. Too often, indeed, anthropology
anthropological discourses conflate these two concepts. However, it is obvious that being alive describes the fact that vital processes such as growth, generation, and so on are observed in living beings, and life refers to a more general principle which causes these vital processes. This is not just a speculative distinction, as it is also visible in technical activities. After Ockart, it is relevant to distinguish productive techniques, which imply interactions with living beings, and ritual techniques, which consist on an interaction with life and with entity that makes living beings alive. To use Ockart's expression, ritual are an application, application of a science of life. For Ockart, the ritual organization is at the core of the social organization of human society. But we can also consider that technical activity and ritual practices establish social relations with non-humans. Descola's book in the Society of Nature offers good insights to better understand this process. The well-known descriptions of hunting and gardening uh, techniques among the Hachoir are a good example of the entanglement of theory of life within technical activities. Since their childhood, boys learn the functioning of the organism of the prey they will hunt. In the garden, the women know how the plants grow. So, the technical interactions with animals or plants imply a complex system of inferences regarding the functioning of the organisms or the ecosystems. But beside these inferences, that we may call very broadly biological or ecological, others involve what I would call social inferences. This is the case, for instance, when before going in the forest, hunters ask permission to the master of the animals, treated as if he were a member of the society. Another level of technical interaction should be then distinguished, not with living beings, but with life. And in this case, the master of the animal or the master of the garden are two personifications of life. In order to make the distinction between living beings or vitality and life even clearer, I will give an example from my ethnographic fieldwork among the Mirre of Oaxaca. My observation of the sacrifice of poultry in agricultural, political, or therapeutical context helps me to discover vernacular theories of life associated to a non-human agent. The Mire address their prayers to an entity called Dikrurk Artpe, literally, he who makes being alive. So, that means they clearly distinguish the fact of being alive and the fact of making or causing this process. My interpretation of a sewing ritual suggests that the technical operation of distribution is a device which aims at coordinate three levels. In the field, at scale one, humans proceed to the distribution of the seeds. The ritual space is like a miniaturization of the field in which the participants distribute several material elements, corn powder, liquor, and so on. Doing so, they ask to he who makes being alive to distribute the rain 
and to make the corn grow. In this case, the ritual techniques are not only a way to coordinate human actions with non-human agency, they also show how the agency of life is conceived as a distribution. Drawing on this ethnographic conceptualization, I have elaborated a comparative model to study conception of life through the description of technical activities. To connect these conceptions with the observation of actions, I suggest to restitute what I call agentive configurations. With this descriptive tool, when you see an interaction with a living being, it is relevant to distinguish various levels of agency. The agency of a living being, the agency of life, the agency of an agent who wants to interact with these two levels, and also the social relation between human and, let's say, metapersons, to use Salin's expression, or the social interactions with living beings. Even if I don't have time today to develop this point, my contention is that this comparative model can be used to describe and analyze Western biotechnologies. I will finish this presentation de delivering a take-home message. If you want to study conception of life, do not focus your attention only on living beings. Observe artifacts and material culture. As you can read it in the quotation, from his epistemological standpoint, Canguilhem considers that philosophy should observe living beings to understand life. According to him, if you want to forge what he calls authentic biological concepts, you should avoid mechanical analogies because there are epistemological obstacles. For the anthropology of life, on the contrary, material cultures of human societies constitute a large field for investigation on vernacular conception of life. Drawing on my observation of a birth ritual among the Mire, I have suggested in a paper published in Current Anthropology that the treatment of the child is articulated with an analogy between morphogenetic process and a technical activity, namely the pottery. In another paper, I give some evidence of relation of circularity we can observe in many societies, Western and non-Western. If, if you compare life to a technical process, it, it often implies that you will act on living beings as if they were artifacts. This is why it is so important to take into account material culture and technical processes. To a certain extent, it is also possible to investigate conception of life through the interactions with non-living materials. For instance, Guilherme Moura Fagundes explains how firefighting in some parts of Brazil is organized with the idea that the fire is alive. In the same manner, the fieldwork investigation of Rosalie Alain on the mining techniques in Cameroon shows that gold can be perceived as alive too. These two excellent PhD, prepared under the supervision of Carlos Schotzuk and Ludovic Kupai, demonstrate how vast is the field of the anthropology of life. To understand the value of investigations on material culture, the constructional approach of Fernando Santos Granero is essential. In mythology and ritual, he analyzes, after Lucia van Velten, 
the symbolic frame of fabrication shared by people and objects in Amazonia. From this standpoint, art craft provide, provides as much information as the interaction with living beings. The best, of course, is to encompass these two fields of research in order to scrutinize the process of hybridization, which can be achieved either by the ensoulment of artifacts or by the embodiment of the qualities of living beings. As long as you study the process, you can use different doors to explore conception of life. For instance, following Maurice Bloch's investigation on the Zafi Manieri of Madagascar, you can either focus on the manipulation of trees or on the constructions of the house. Bloch explains how vernacular theory of life are not based on a clear distinction between living beings and artifacts. Instead of biological inferences, we discover the existence of biotechnic or biotechnical theories entangled in technical practices. And again, we observe the technical transformation of uh, living beings as a moment in the construction of social relations as the house is the materialization of a new family in which the ancestors are incorporated in the wood. A final example is provided by the wonderful ethnographic conceptualization of Carlos Solchuk. His analysis of the harpoon aptly shows how an object, a non-living object, can shed light on the vernacular conception of life. Indeed, the form of the harpoon used by the fisherman to, cut, to catch the piraruku fish is the materialization of two relations with two living systems, the end and the body of a human who manipulates these tools, and the body of the animal, which is caught. Furthermore, the harpoon incorporates the qualities of two milieu, namely the air and the water in which it transits. So, to understand an, an ecosystem, it is not enough to describe the interactions with living beings. It is also essential to analyze the mediation of technical objects. According to this ethnographic conceptualization, if you want to give more precision to the restitution of an adjunctive configuration, it is relevant to try to answer the following question. What are the relations between artifacts or technical processes and living beings or vital processes? Metaphorization, analogy, hybridization, transformation, mediation are one of the many relations you can unearth in your investigation. And again, this descriptive tool participate to a comparative model as it allows to describe uh, techniques in very different societies, Western and non-Western. To sum up, I will suggest that the anthropology of techniques helps to refocus the approach of the anthropology of life. It helps to avoid the biocentrism of biology in order to take into account the social technical context, to pay attention to the distinction between living beings and life, to connect technical relations with social relations, and last but not least, to analyze the many relations between living beings and artifacts. Hello, I hope that uh, you and yours are doing okay under the current circumstances and I would like to start by thanking Carlos and Dilerme for inviting me to their seminar. So my presentation uh, will hopefully mirror 
uh, periods uh, one, as I will discuss the way in which the dialogue of the anthropology of techniques uh, with the anthropology of life has been a fruitful one, at least for me. So first, I would like to detail a bit uh, what I mean by techniques and why I've written it with a C instead of the Q U. So basically for me, techniques are point of encounter or convergence between humans and their milieu. As you will notice, I put humans here between brackets uh, simply because I'm perfectly aware that there are various non-human living beings who also have techniques, uh, who build nests and etc. Uh, but here, for the, in this presentation, I will focus uh, only on human ones. But we will see in the course of that, of course, that they are relations. Second, as you also noticed, I've put milieu between bracket because I prefer that term to the one of environment. Um, for me, milieu, in a sense, always implies something in which we are, human and non-human, immersed in and with which we are in a sort of ecological relations. And I think that this idea of a techniques as the study of techniques as being basically the study of uh, ecological relations is a very important one. So there are three things that I want to detail about techniques. First of all, techniques for me are modality or relation between both sides. And these modalities can be an encounter, that is the encounter of humans and milieu make emerge certain techniques. Mediation, that is that indeed humans use certain techniques to mediate with their milieu and sometimes even on the other dimension or coupling and the idea of coupling is very important because that means that techniques cannot be defined in, uh, alone in themselves but uh, by this relational uh, uh, model between human and milieu. Second, techniques are fundamentally processes that means that they unfold through time and space. This also means that they are in relation with other processes existing in their milieu. So, for example, such as vital processes, such as, for example, in the case of fermentation, uh, when uh, the, ye the yeast in itself can be an active agent, or sometimes even as a result. But they are also in relation with other technical processes, which might be related or not. So, for example, the making of pottery implies certain techniques of extraction of clay and treatment of clay, and then, of course, uh, uh, techniques of decoration of pottery. Third, techniques always include relation with different material worlds, and I put S here very intentionally. So among this material world, there is in itself the human body, of course, the human agent, but there is also part of these different material worlds, the place or places in which the technical activities unfold. But in terms of material worlds, I also uh, include uh, other meta-human or perhaps even meta-living entities such as spirits and divinities that can be part of the material in between bracket in which the activity will uh, unfold. You can see that also I'm mentioning, I'm including within this idea of material uh, world uh, things, material things that are both used and produced. And as I said, they can be themselves results and they can be uh, living beings such as, for example, the horse uh, um, uh, which is uh, used to, uh, uh, to carry a cart. So as such, I use technique as a relation between human and milieu, which involve two important components. Technical activities, which are techniques, in the sense of techniques of the body, the QUS, the techniques, and that's the reason why I make the distinction, but also technical object, in which I include anything that you use purposefully, either made for it, or not, such as, for example, a wooden stick picked up in a forest. So anything that can be used in the course of a technical activity. Of course, when I talk about uh, objects, technical objects, those objects can be totally intangible. So for example, when one can think of an algorithm or a particular software. So what I'm talking about here is the fact that when we consider the different form of uh, uh, techniques then it might not be wise to separate indeed the anthropology of techniques from the anthropology of life lest we reproduce classical divided such as nature culture nature society or people thing so now as you can see i've used the term technical technical activity and technical object and now i'm going to go in a bit into detail what i'm using that term 
That terms come from Marcel Mauss' famous definition of a technical act, uh, which is an act which is effective and traditional. Those two terms are very, very important. Effective, it is the effectiveness or the efficacy according to the actor, which means, and that's absolutely crucial, that what we are talking about here is the vernacular efficacy. That is that the actors taking a specific action with the intention of producing an effect, whether that effect is achieved or not later. And the second part is the idea of traditional. Here, most use the term traditional to insist on the fact that those techniques, technical acts, are learned and transmitted according, and that's also very important, to specific recognized and shared norms. So for example, this is like my ancestors did, or uh, this is how you're supposed to do that. So what is very interesting about uh, this definition is the fact that it is a formula, as uh, François Sigaud has actually indicated it. It is not a theory. And it is such a powerful heuristic uh, formula that most could use that for ritual, religious, prayer, for example, but also for aesthetic act. But what is very, very important about those two terms is the fact that it allows us to think about the ways in which the both terms contain within themselves the ideas that techniques have to be considered appropriate for the intention and for the actor. So this idea of appropriateness means that technical activity have moral dimensions. And in doing so, we avoid, by using that, the notion of technical, the deterministic, utilitarian, and totally Eurocentric understanding of the concept of technology. As you will see later, that the term technical that I use for activity can also be applied to objects. To illustrate this conception of techniques and its link with the anthropology of life, I will use uh, my ethnography of long yam cultivation, decoration and display among the community of ambulance speakers who are uh, known in the liter literature, sorry, the anthropological literature as the Abilam. So the ambulance speakers are agricultural um, communities who are living in Mapric area of the East Tepic province in Papua New Guinea. They are known in uh, the anthropological literature for two uh, um, phenomena. First uh, is a very, very rich uh, visual uh, production, which was created in the past uh, for initiation, and which is now uh, present uh, in the collection of every Euro-American museum. Second, they were also known for the display and exchange, and competitive exchange in particular, of massive tubers, which were cultivated to reach the size up to three meters and weigh up to 60 kilograms, and were represented, decorated in the way in which I show them to you, um, in a very rich fashion during annual ceremonies. So though I was uh, already focusing on a plant, and in a sense I was doing uh, post-human ethnography without naming it, my approach to yams was to take them as artifact. For me, this was a heuristic choice, indeed, in contrast with the then dominant interpretation of yams in anthropology as symbols or images and on their role in exchange. Indeed, long yams were displayed as ancestral figure and coming from the anthropology of art, I was interested with images and material culture, uh, but they were also interpreted as powerful, valuable as part of a set of competitive exchanges of which several authors have written. They were even considered as a sort of phallic symbols. By treating them as artifact, my aim was to add something to the interpretation uh, uh, of uh, them as being images or valuable, um, and as such, having a particular agency uh, um, which I felt was often considering them mostly from the angle of finished product. It was as if I felt that their social capacity was only coming from their appearance or their role in exchanges as a screen upon which human discourses and regime of signification could be projected and owed little, in fact, to the ways in which they were actually made to do so. So for me, treating them as artifact was uh, a way to document how the capacity to occupy different roles was stemming from the processes from which they emerged. And as such, indeed, 
they were acting as images, but they were also indeed used as valuables in exchanges. Uh, they were the substitute of person, which is a very important theme in Melanesian uh, anthropology. And they were exchanged during mat matrimonial conversations, funerary conversation, but also dispute conversation. But also when I realized that they were also food, obviously, contrary to the literature that often considered that ceremonial yams were not eaten, these were eaten. And as such, they were a very important part of uh, the constitution of the body, of community, of all the themes that the anthropology of food has uh, discussed upon. There's this idea of commensality, of transfer of substance, and etc. But I was underplaying one element which was there all along, was the fact that there were also plants. And that's something that really the anthropology of life have made me, um, uh, I wouldn't say realize, but forced me to take into account. They were also living beings. Yams are tubers, which reproduce through replication. And that was indeed what the botanical description have uh, demonstrated. So this is a system of cloning. You take a tuber, you cut a piece of it, you replant it, and that gives you the same uh, individual plant, if you want, during the next harvest. But also from a, uh, beyond this ethic dimension, they were also considered vernacularly as living being, and they were said to be able to hear, smell, and sometimes even move. So in order to describe them, I used the method of, that came from the Francophone Anthropology of Techniques, and in particular, the method of the chaîne opératoire, which for me was a way, was a, a framework for collecting and then presenting uh, processes. And the way in which that works is, I realized very quickly that the yams were emerging for a mixing of agents, both human and non-human, such as, for example, spirits, but also earthworms and other um, uh, elements, flowers and etc., and the color of flower. Materials, not only the tangible material, but also invisible materials such as the breath, the breath, sorry, the breath, sorry, uh, but also actions which included not only classical technical action of digging and etc., but also singing and dancing and also exchanging. And that leads me to another very important element that became part of what yams were made uh, of was sociality. Indeed, one of the ways in which people may grow yam is by engaging in social relation, and I will say more about that in a, in a moment. And finally, substances. And those substances are actual substances that you know, we can touch and see, such as water uh, or uh, soil, or, um, or even colors, uh, but also invisible substances such as the juai, these sort of substances which reside in the body, a little bit like the mana uh, that can be transmitted through touch or sweat or other form or even through signals. And I looked at the way those different elements, if you will, were mobilized, combined, intertwined in the course of the technical activity. And I followed that technical activity all the long the cultivation process, which lasted for one year, from one ceremony to the next one in the same place. And by following the technical activity of cultivation, decoration, display, I realized that I cut across the entire or several elements, several, the majority of uh, um, the village life. That is that I realized that by following the cultivation process, I encountered elements such as gender, political relations, pol um, politics, political relation between the villages, but also national politics, as well as religion, including the Catholic Church, relation between the ages, relation with the other villages, and that included different set of actual technical activities such as digging, building the trellis, building a house, and etc., and so on and so forth. So by doing so, by following the technical process of cultivation, I actually performed what I called, coming from the ecological term, a transect through a very complex, heterogeneous whole. So from a methodological perspective, that led me to consider the, that when we follow technical activity, what we do actually, we are seeing how the performance of those techniques actually mobilize human and non-humans and cut across 
and mobilize and in fact instantiate series of collectives such as descent group, uh, age group, gender relationships, but also spirits from the forest or spirits that are living underground and so on and so forth. And as it, the technical process goes along, it recruits elements and it actually encapsulates it within the yam, within the final result. And this is what exactly gives the yam that particular power. So as you can see here, I represented the different notch in the processes. And this is because this process is not a smooth one, but in fact it's made, it's made of several steps and breaks. And that gives the entire sequences its rhythm, which, as I explained, give uh, um, uh, create times, but it also creates the rhythm of the village life, of activities, not only related to uh, uh, yam cultivation. And all those different notches, if you want, correspond to series of efficacious or effective and traditional actions, which all contains elements of appropriateness or this idea of appropriateness and morality. But what is very interesting and what is very important is when you follow the technical activity along, all along uh, uh, the process is it allows you to delineate, outline, perceive, sometimes very clearly, sometimes less clearly, and you need to resort to other type of ethnography, uh, what is one of the most important things for anthropologists, which is vernacular categories, such as, for example, life, or life-giving principle. And when I realized it from a methodological perspective, what I did for yams was also valid and could be applied also to other form of uh, uh, techniques. And that's the reason why I'm showing you in this um, animation there, you could potentially use exactly the same method to algorithm, shoes, cake, cooking, and etc. and etc. So going back to what I was talking about, and because technical techniques are our uh, relation, an ecological relation, one can say, indeed, that the anthropology of techniques is, um, uh, focuses, rather, on three dimensions or aspects of this relation. Technical activities, which includes body technique, gestures, skill, cognition, personhood, identity, and depending on the scales in which you are actually focusing, you can reveal those different elements. But also, technical objects that are recruited in the process uh, itself. Material ones, such as the digging stick that you can see here, Wesley holding in his hand to actually dig the ground, or other one, uh, such as the trellis that emerge out of the process of growing the yam, which is the combination, the encounter, if you will, as I said before, between the yam as a plant and its own processes and the human activity that is helping the yam to grow. But what is also very interesting is both technical activities and technical objects are part of wider network or meshwork. I use here the term, which is really impractical. I'm still struggling to find another term, uh, technical social pol political system. So this wider um, um, network or meshwork extends further in time and space, like a little bit process of reticulation. And, and the example that I'm giving you here, which I will say a few words, is actually the entire network of stones, secret stones, that are actually fueling the fertility and uh, the process of reproduction of yams, which is an actual vernacular infrastructure, if one may say. As the people then say, this is their own understanding of what an er energy grid is, which actually covers the entire ambulance speaking area. And the analysis of those three elements, um, because of uh, the fundamental empirical and pragmatic angle of the anthropology of techniques, allows for the delineation of the role of the different entities, be they living or not living, the different energies, the different processes, be they vital processes or technical processes. Let uh, me uh, give you an example of uh, what the inclusion of rituals uh, as part of techniques did to my analysis. First, obviously, it helped me avoiding the divide between society and technology. But it also helped me outlining 
what was the target of technical activities? This is the question that I asked to Tepanyengi, who was then a chief and a ritual expert, an old man, a big man, or a great man rather, uh, who was very knowledgeable in long yam growings and all sorts of uh, ritual and social manner. He was considered by the Nyamikon people as the chief of their village. And I asked him, why do people make long yam ceremonies? And he said, that's very simple. In fact, people make long yam ceremonies because that pleases the yam. And if the yams are pleased, they will come back next year and we're going to be able to harvest long and big yams. And harvesting in long and big yams, the decorated one, we open the road to all other foods. So for that, that was a vernacular explanation. That was a vernacular sort of a logic of the entire processes. And that indeed forces me to include the ritual as part of the technical processes of growing yam. And I'm giving you here a sort of representation, almost in the form of a, of a chaîne opératoire, if you want, of the entire process to help us understand the, the, the logical link here that we have. So first you have the wapisaki ceremony on the left here, which is the name of the ceremony, in which you decorate and display the long yam, and then you exchange them, and then they are replanted. This entire ceremonial event actually is absolutely central because it's going to please the yam, give them heat, yeah, the fire. And because they're going to be pleased, when you're going to replant them this season, the next year, they will come back. You will harvest long and big yam. And it is very important to harvest long and big yam because when they do so, they open the road, literally, they open the road to all other food. So that means that the ceremony is an essential point, and it is indeed the movement from one cycle to another one, a central point, a central step in the production of food, that is to reproduce society, and not solely its bodies, in the literal sense, but also its norms, its values. It also shows the, the complex cyclical dimension of long ceremony, uh, long yam ceremony, sorry. So, you cultivate now, you harvest, that opens all of the food, then you replant, and that will reproduce the entire cycle. So that demonstrated that the ceremony was indeed a crucial uh, element of the reproduction of the village life. So that also indicated that there is something within the long yam complex uh, technical processes which pertains to the reproduction of the social and the cosmological order of which we're going to see a little bit later. And this is so because the cultivation processes mobilize a whole range of collectives of descent groups, of spirits, of relations with other entities inhabiting the territory, but also with other villages, as we will see. But also, what it helped me was the fact that the long yams were the actual result of a real implication, or sorry, of a real imbrication uh, of vital processes and technical processes. And we'll go in a little bit into more detail with the example of the short yams. So, yams are living beings from a botanical perspective, also from a nemical perspective. And as such, they contain the source of vital processes, which, as Perig has uh, discussed, escape the realm of direct experience, but of which the effect or result can be experienced and engaged with. This is how one grows a yam. So first, you dig a hole. And you fill up and the earth, you clean that earth and you put the hole, the earth, the soil back into the hole that you have dug, but by cleaning it of all its uh, hard pieces. And that creates a sort of little mound and a hole, a mound on the top and a hole on the bottom of loosened soil. Then you place the germinated tuber just close to the top with the germinated side, which is uh, there. What happens is as the time goes, the first tuber that you have planted empty itself, desiccate, and then you start to have several tubers. But you also have the vine that grows. And as the lamb grows and grows and grows, it creates a very remarkable visible form. Uh, it climbs on the stake, which is a very important element, upon which have been erected by humans, and it creates a sort of green column, very, very beautiful, very striking, right? And new tubers proliferate underneath, 
And as the vine desiccates, you've got the multiplication of tubers. And when the vine is completely gray, you can harvest the tubers themselves. So here we've got a, a very interesting uh, combination of technical activity, digging the hole, filling it up with the hands. Uh, you've got technical object, you've got the hole itself, which is a technical object per se, because it's part of the entire processes. You've got the stake, you've got the, upon which the vine goes, you've got the digging stick, you've got the, all those elements that are uh, part of that. And with which the process, the vital processes that makes a yam grow is in sort deeply imbricated and dances with. And the way in which cultivator perceive that is a sort of indeed engagement with the behavior of the plant. What does that do with long yams? Well, with long yams, it's exactly the same principle, but it's really, really sort of like bigger. So you dig a deeper hole. And in fact, before you, you fill it up, you place a cane in the middle, and then you fill it up with the loosened soil. And you remove the cane, which creates a sort of tube of not empty, but very loose uh, 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 ground, if you will. And then you create that mound on the top here, and you place the germinated tuber there. You put a wall here because usually people uh, um, build their uh, gardens on the slope. So what happened is, as the time grow, you the, the vine will climb and the cultivator, oops, sorry, the cultivator will gently place the yam on the trellis, on the bed of which you have an image on the side, and it will grow and grow and grow up until the moment it reached the lower part. And it creates this sort of very giant, like sort of green cathedral, very beautiful. And what happens here is as the vine grows, the cultivator every day comes into his garden and help and lay down gently the vines on the trellis and build up the trellis. So the trellis is built as the yam is actually growing. That's the first part. In the meantime, the seed that has been placed desiccates itself, empties itself, and you've got several tubers that start to emerge just at the top of the mound, and the gardener removes all of them but one. And that's the one which is supposed to be become the long yam. So as the time uh, goes, the vine grow, become very green, and the tuber gets bigger and bigger. And in the second part of the year, the yam start to desiccate again, and there is as if there was another movement here in which the entire sort of uh, nutrients of the vines are transferred into the tuber, who literally shoots down the hole. That's how the people are saying that. So here, what we see is several things. You see, we see forms emerging from the, 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 the technical processes. You've seen the trellis, but you also see the yam that grows in itself. Among the different techniques that are used, people are also singing to the vines, which means that there is something that outlines that has the potential to tell us something about the song itself, its melody, its lyric, which mobilizes spirits and places in a repetitive manner, not very far from what Lepmaninovsky has documented for the Trobriands, but also it tells me something about the singer, uh, his body, his capacity, its substances, and finally tells me something about the vines, where the capacity to react to that. There is an entire set of other uh, interesting uh, uh, techniques that are used, such as calling butterfly and etc. But what uh, I found very interesting in that process is, is the fact that here the yam is a real co-agent, as a sense that it's its vital, vital processes that grows, and the target of technical activities are not so much the yam itself, or acting upon the yam itself, but acting on it and with its own behavior. So that's a very important part here because that really shows that indeed techniques of long yam growings are techniques that works with the behavior of the yam, not against it or not directing it. So that's a one of the first parts. So in a sense, not only techniques are creating food, but yams themselves are creating food uh, in the sense that Tikman Yungi was. So it is the imbrication of the technical processes, of the uh, vital processes of the yam, and the, the result of their intricacy that allows the social and cosmological reproduction. But there is something else also that, which is far removed from the garden, and I'm referring to a very complex, and I can only say a few words, uh, um, uh, uh, 
phenomenon or aspect of yam cultivation, which is the vernacular power grid, as the people themselves call it. So somewhere in the village, there is a yam storage house, uh, which is completely undifferentiated from any others, in which people have uh, created a stone uh, shrine or altar. And the stone is called here, the, I call the stone the Matu. It's not really its name, but Matu means stone in Ambulus. And that stone is a very secret um, uh, um, uh, object, uh, which is uh, in the ward of a specific descent group who is in charge of its maintenance and the ritual activity. And in fact, the work around that stone is to maintain the set of connection with the different uh, descent group within the village. So every coconut bowl that you have here, which are represented, this is a top view down, are actually supposed to be representing the major descent group of the entire village. And you've got the stone here, and uh, alongside the stone, you've got shell rings that have been given by other villages. And by doing so, those rings are connecting the village Nyamikum with other villages and these other villages or other cultivators are actually able to benefit from the power of the stone to give fertility because this is what this stone is about. So here you've got a very particular technical dispositive or apparatus which indeed act as a, as a vernacular infrastructure and which power the entire area. But there is also a political dimension because every village has a set of stone. They are stones that are for growing yams, stones for growing taro, there were stones for the reproduction of birds, there were stones for pigs, there were also supposedly stones for human babies, although nobody is sure of that. And what is uh, uh, happened is every village has a set, like a hand of cards, of those stones, and they can use those stones. But if they find that somebody else has a stone which is more powerful, and that's the reason why they go and visit other villages, Yam Seruni, then instead of connecting my garden to my village stone, I'm going to connect my garden to another. So you see here, there is a very complex system of fluid relations, which implies also geopolitical relation within the area, because the entire area is, is also striated with uh, alliance and, and customary enmities and, and conflict and etc. But all of that works together. And what is absolutely extraordinary is the fact that this system actually gives its rhythm to the production of food of the entire Abelam area. Basically, long yam cultivation starts in the east towards village E on my map. And as the time go, so we are in March, in May, the ceremonies are held in the village further that are further um, uh, eastward. So sorry, we start in the west and eastward. And what is interesting is this movement from west to west is also the movement of uh, mythical migration of the people. So here we see a shrine which is a miniature, indeed also, of uh, uh, social relations, but also the source of that sort of uh, uh, vital reproduction of the community. And there is an old set of different terms of energy that circulate that are uh, uh, part of that system. Finally, and that's a very important uh, element of the ethnography, is the yam in itself is, and the way in which the yam behave as an agent is a very important uh, paradigm for thinking through processes of reproduction and vital processes and life and the reproduction of life. As I told you, when you plant a yam, you plant the seed and the seed itself empty, empty itself, empties itself, and then it grows and then it is absorbed again, and then the new tuber is. What is absolutely fascinating is there are linguistic evidence that link the yam mound that you can see on the right side of the of um, uh, of the slide with the yam structure, the yam trellis, which also present formal but also linguistic link with the ceremonial house of which you've got a picture on the left taken by me and a, a side view uh, um, uh, on the bottom one. And there are different elements. I don't have to, the time to go into detail there, but those, uh, yam, uh, those uh, ceremonial house were uh, the site in which initiates were sent to see the putti. The putti were those very complex figures of which you have got an image here, androgen, wearing 
what was said to be a net bag on its back, which reproduce exactly the same form, again, as the yamound. And the putty means the one who is empty because he had given everything out, and particularly all living things. Indeed, the putty is supposed to be the figure of the original creation of life, of everything that exists. So you can see here how those forms echoes with one another and pertain around a certain conception of um, reproduction of life, which goes into that movement of going out, emptying itself, and going in and producing new. And that's the entire system, which I believe was a very interesting element. And that came from the analysis of yam cultivation. Going back to my original methodological perspective, one sees that techniques as processes involve a diversity of agencies. For the anthropology of life, it is particularly the one that appears as vernacular categories and when and where these operate, which are interesting. For the anthropology of techniques, it invites me to think through the different agentive configurations that permeate and constitute techniques. Though I chose to focus on humans, these agency can also be considered as the manifestations or indexes of either vital processes, living beings, or even higher entities such as divinities or spirits, or more abstract concepts such as life or the living. As we can see in the case of long yam cultivation, the anthropology of techniques reveals that the process mobilizes and recruits a wide range of principles properties and entities, an heterogeneous combination, some of them which are the concern of the anthropology of life. In addition to the plant itself, we've got actual living beings which populate the garden, such as other plants, insects, earthworms, as well as, far beyond the garden, a range of all other entities, species, materials, and etc., the role of which can be either punctual or more permanent, but are nonetheless absolutely central. But there also are vital processes themselves, which animate and make things grow, move, or interact with their milieu. We can also point out properties relating to life that can be attributed to inanimate objects and materials, such as stones or the ground itself. I have outlined some of these here, uh, but it is true that the works remains to be done to understand further what these are and what their role is. But importantly, the anthropology of techniques reveal how long yam cultivation creates a specific social, political, cosmological, and environmental milieu, and one can delineate a whole ecology in which human and non-humans, living beings and artifacts, materials and organisms are immersed in specific agentive configuration. However, outside of indigenous contexts, the relation between techniques and life is becoming more than ever a crucial one. Indeed, in hyper-industrialized contexts, we are witnessing the development of digital devices and the extension of autonomous processes and even autonomous objects, such as algorithm, vocal assistance, or robot. And their agency is no longer solely metaphorical or cognitive. Their increasing imbrication within living processes and their ecological effects reintroduce the relation between machines, living beings, human activities, and their milieu as important anthropological topics. First, because these developments are uh, give, sorry, an increasing central agency and role to non-human technical objects in technical activities, they seem to reconfigure interaction with human actors in specific ways. Second, because if techniques are and generate ecological relation between living beings and their milieu, and if, as anthropologists know, both human and milieu are co-configured through their technical relation, then one might want to pay attention to the effective role of these new agencies and new agentive configuration on the terms. Third, because these techniques reconfigure existing vernacular category according to the relation they manifest and actualize, 
which include the ones that the anthropology of life is concerned with. These questions are not only anthropological concern, but indeed pertains to the social, moral, and environmental milieu which techniques actualize sorry, and generate. We have already demonstrated the socio-technical construction of what we call technology, and we can recognize now their role as also shaping our understandings of society, the self, the environment, or life. Thus, we can avoid seeing them as neutral means, which would, in a sense, absolve them, so to speak, from their inherent moral grounding. In other words, Anthropological investigation of techniques can ask what type of vernacular relations with humanities, milieu, living beings and ecologies these techniques make emerge, or what type of social, moral and environmental life do they generate. Maybe some of the ethnographic answers can be found, indeed, in the relationships between the anthropology of techniques and the anthropology of life. Thank you very much. tarde, é, eu peço para liberar meu vídeo aqui. Carol. Carlos, é só tu ligar o vídeo. Ele não está tá autorizado. Eu já te autorizei, só um segundinho, então. Pode tentar de novo. Agora sim. Bom, é, muito obrigado, Perig e o Ludovic, pelas belíssimas conferências. Eu peço, eu peço desculpas aqui pelos problemas técnicos da transmissão. Nós vamos começar... Agora a sessão de debates, em torno de meia hora, para a qual nós teremos a participação do Luiz Costa, um antropólogo e professor da UFRJ. Eu peço para abrirem a câmera do Luiz Costa, que fará a tradução é, entre o inglês e o português. Eu peço aos colegas aqui no Zoom que façam umas questões em português. Né? Quem nos acompanha pelo YouTube também pode fazer questões. É, eu peço que abram, então, a, a câmera do Luiz, para ele poder fazer essa tradução e também do Ludovic, do Perig e do Guilherme. Well, um, thank you very much, Perig and Ludovic, for the wonderful conferences. Uh, I apologize for the issues at the start of the transmission. We will now begin the debate session with the participation of Luis Costa, anthropologist and professor at the University of Rio de Janeiro, who will translate from English to Portuguese. I ask our colleagues to please ask their questions through the Zoom trans transmission in Portuguese. Those who are following us via YouTube can write out their questions in the chat, either in English or in Portuguese. Obrigado, Luiz. Bom, passamos então para a primeira das perguntas, que é feita pelo Eduardo de Deus. Eduardo, pode abrir o, o vídeo e fazer sua pergunta uh, ao vivo. Eu peço. Bom, não sei se vocês me escutam e me veem. Sim. Uh, bom, eu tinha colocado por escrito para otimizar, mas eu vou, vou aproveitar para fazer uma saudação à, à organização, parabenizar pelo evento e ao Perig e ao Ludovic pelas belas apresentações. Né? Minha pergunta ela se dirige a partir de uh, um fato que o Ludovic abordou, que é a dimensão rítmica uh, das ações técnicas que são capturadas pelas cadeias operatórias, né? como ele bem argumenta, que são uh, ferramentas de pesquisa valiosas né, para a antropologia das técnicas. Eu pediria, então, para, para o Ludovic e o Perig refletirem sobre as relações entre os ritmos técnicos e os ritmos viventes ou, ou orgânicos nesses encontros, né, 
além é, de perguntar se eles veem um potencial do, do ritmo para a gente compreender processos de aprendizagem. Uh, muito obrigado. Uh, so Eduardo de Deus, from uh, the University of Brasilia, uh, congratulates the event organizers and uh, Perig and Ludovic for the wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, he asked, well, he says, mentions Ludovic spoke of the rhythmic dimension uh, of acts that are captured by operational sequences or the chain opératoire as a research tool. I would like to ask Perig and him to reflect on the relations between technical rhythms and living rhythms, as well as to the potential of rhythm to think through processes of learning. Obrigado, Luiz. Vamos ouvir, então, o Perig e o Ludovic. So, well, it's quite a complicated uh, question. Uh, my first uh, answer would be to say that um, as uh, we can define uh, technical activities as a coordination between various agencies, we can say that there is a specificity of the temporality of either uh, uh, an organism or an object. So it will be my, my first answer to say that We've got, in this case, two temporality which are associated with uh, material culture and with living beings. And obviously, uh, it's not the same kind of uh, constraints that it is, it is imposed by uh, a living being and an organism, uh, uh, an artifact. But obviously, if you enter on uh, the distinction between tool and machine, here you will um, see how a new rhythmicity could be imposed uh, from the outside to the, uh, uh, the temporality of the organism. So yeah, I think it's a way of describing uh, how we can coordinate these uh, different levels of um, agency. I'm sorry, Pehik, I had some prob technical problems and I missed the start of your, of your reply. But from, uh, you could repeat it, please, that would be great. Um, I, I was saying that uh, if we define technical activities as a coordination between different uh, agencies, obviously it involves uh, different uh, temporalities. So there is a different uh, temporalities uh, related with an organism, human and non-human, but also with a tool and with machine, because the machine will, uh, will obviously impose a rhythm to uh, 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 living beings which are connected to this machine. Ah, o, uh, então, o Perrig respondeu um, que, ah, bom, definindo as atividades técnicas como uma coordenação entre diferentes agências, envolve também diferentes temporalidades relacionadas ao organismo, humano e não humano, mas também aos artefatos. Uh, e as máquinas, e que enfim, a resposta seria por aí. Ótimo. Vamos ouvir o Ludovic? Sim, eu não tenho realmente muito, porque eu quero deixar muito mais para adicionar o que o Perry já disse, que é, você sabe, em síntese, exatamente isso. Mas, as soon as you see techniques as the, uh, the point of encounter between human and their milieu, right? You have, indeed, the, 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 you have to take into account. The, the, the different temporal rhythm, right? In the case of um, the way in which people cultivate yams, obviously there, the temporality of the plant itself, right, is part of the element with which the cultivators are, are interacting, uh, but they can to a certain extent um, speed or slow the process. So that's really a sort of a combination. And that's very interesting to see what are the techniques they are using to, to create that. But as soon as we delegate the temporality to indeed technical objects that have a pre-inscribed, predetermined sort of rhythm, you are in the domain of Charlie Chaplin um, movies, right? That you know perfectly um, the uh, uh, modern times, right? And that's completely different. And then the time, the imposition of temporality is, upon, is imposed upon uh, human actors, but also as we can see with, um, you know, agro-industry, The, the temporality of the machines and the entire technical system is imposed upon the living being. So that creates all sorts of environmental issues that we know very well. Bom, o Ludovic disse que assim que a gente um, leva em consideração a relação do humano com o seu meio, 
que envolvem temporalidades diferentes, a gente assume que ah, os humanos podem controlar, de certa forma, essas temporalidades. O exemplo do inhame, em que eles podem controlar por técnicas os processos temporais, isso é uma coisa. Mas assim que a gente inscreve um ritmo pré-determinado de temporalidade, a gente já entra num ambiente do tipo tempos modernos, do Charlie Chaplin, em que as máquinas impõem a sua temporalidade própria. A gente está num regime distinto aqui, ah, nesse caso. Maravilha. Obrigado, Luiz. É, vou lembrar tanto para as perguntas, e vou lembrar aqui pelo chat também para o Peri e para o Ludovic, para que se forem é, é, mais longas, que se faça uma interrupção no meio para o Luiz poder fazer a tradução e depois vocês terminam. Vamos fazer agora blocos, é, porque nós temos mais inscrições, então vou fazer o Rodrigo, em seguida o Fabiano. Rodrigo. Olá. Olá, olá, estão me ouvindo? Perfeito. Sim, sim. É, obrigado, gente, obrigado, professor Perig, professor Ludovic, pela apresentação, e parabéns também, Guilherme e Carlos, pela, pela organização do evento. Eu sou Rodrigo Bolamais, sou postdoc na Unifesp. É, a minha pergunta, na verdade, é, é, sendo bastante sucinto, é, seria para os dois, né? tanto o Perigo quanto o Ludovic. É, ouvindo o professor Perigo falar, eu fiquei pensando sobre a maneira como, historicamente, no trabalho de antropologia, a, a, autores e autoras mobilizam a ideia de vida, né? a noção de vida. Isso até, enfim, a gente sabe de trabalhos clássicos, o, o Perigo mostrou isso em algumas imagens que empregam a, a ideia de vida no próprio título e, e trabalhos mais recentes também, né? pensando no Mark Harris ou na própria Anne Singh. É, mas, ao mesmo tempo, esses trabalhos falam um pouco de uma ideia uh, de vida no sentido uh, uh, vernacular, né? Uh, um, um, a vida enquanto uma categoria nativa, para se a gente for empregar uma ideia que o Ludovic um pouco discutiu na apresentação dele. Então, eu, eu fiquei pensando aqui como, se, se, né, como a gente pensa essa noção de vida. Né? Me parece que, historicamente, ela aparece de maneira muito heurística, né? A vida social é... é, é então, eu fiquei pensando se, se, se é possível, nos, nos nossos trabalhos, a gente tentar chegar de antemão mesmo a uma ideia a uma, uma ideia nativa, uma categoria nativa de vida é, 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 etnograficamente. É isso. Obrigado. Obrigado, Luiz, pela tradução. Obrigado. Uh, well, Rodrigo Bulama, of the Federal University of São Paulo, thanks to the presenters and the organizers and the uh, Perig and Ludovic for the wonderful conferences. Uh, his question is directed to both uh, Perig and Ludovic, and he was thinking of how historically anthropology has mobilized ideas of life uh, in classic ethnographies and classic theoretical works, as Perig showed, which include life in the title, uh, as well as more recent work uh, on that thing and a few others, which also do with the category of life. But none of these uh, works, or the majority of them, don't really speak of life as a vernacular category, as a native category, as Ludovic mentioned in his work. So uh, Rodrigo's question is, how do we think of this category of life if we can try to define life a priori or even to reach a native category of life as such? Uh, just a second, Perig and Dudo, we've got one more question and then you ah, okay. come back, okay? Uh, Fabian? Olá. Bom, me ouvem? Sim. Bom, bom, bom dia para todo mundo. Também um prazer estar aqui, feliz com esse evento. Parabenizo todos, inclusive os palestrantes de hoje. É, eu vou ajudar o Luiz. Meu, minha filiação é a Universidade Federal do Sul e Sudeste do Pará. É, eu, meu nome é Fabiano, né? É, bom, eu tenho uma pergunta é, objetiva, digamos. É... Como o Perig apresentou, a gente tem uma proposta, ele está propondo, uma proposta de comparativa de teorias da vida que a gente poderia encontrar. Né? Eu queria saber se a gente pode fazer o mesmo movimento em relação a uma conceitualização plural, uma conceitualização das técnicas, é, teorias da técnica, ou, ou o que a gente pode encontrar hoje, é, formulações sobre tecnodiversidades ou cosmotécnicas. É, sem que a gente recaia nesse movimento, numa oposição também de tradição e modernidade, né? e como que essas... Enfim, isso daria um outro assunto, mas como que essas duas, a, as técnicas modernas ocidentais e as não ocidentais poderiam estar se relacionando né, no, é, na contemporaneidade. Mas a minha questão é sobre essa, como pensar as cosmotécnicas, que teorias da técnica, é, como teorizá-las, etc. Ok? 
thank you for Fabiano Bechelai again. I congratulate everyone and thanks the presenters. Uh, he's uh, at the uh, Federal University of the South of South and Southwestern Para. And uh, he asked, well, he mentions says that Pity presents or proposes actually a theoretical comparison of anthropologies of life. And he wonders if we can do the same in terms of a plural conception of theories of, of, of theories of techniques or of techniques and of ideas such as techno diversity and cosmo techniques. And also he wonders how this relates to ideas of modernity and tradition and how the former would affect the latter, how modern, uh, I guess, modern theories of techniques or modern techniques would affect traditional ones. Uh, that's it. Shall we answer or waiting just, for a third question? Ah, just a question. Uh, I was with the micro. Uh, one more question, just, uh, uh, just a second. É, eu vou fazer aqui a questão do Guilherme Sá, porque ela tem uma conexão com a primeira, e aí nós fazemos três juntas. A questão dele é a seguinte, o Guilherme Sá é professor da Universidade de Brasília, coordena comigo o Laboratório de Antropologia da Ciência e da Técnica. E a pergunta dele é, uh, como foi definida a antropologia da vida e do viver? Né, nesse sentido? Ela pretende sintetizar diversas contribuições valorosas de autores de diversas vertentes teóricas. Né? Mas qual seria, então, o ganho o potencial e o de adotar uma, uma definição tão ampla, né, de definição da vida e do viver? É a terceira questão, então, e aí depois eles já podem responder. Okay. Uh, uh, Guilherme Sá, da University of Brasília. He says that an anthropology of life and living, as defined, aims to synthesize several valuable contributions by authors of different theoretical traditions. What are the potential and heuristic gains in adopting such a wide definition? I, I would ask Perig and Ludovic as well to uh, reply in short blocks. So I yeah, I will, I will answer to the three questions in a row. Uh, first of all, to the last one, uh, precisely, uh, I. I didn't uh, give a definition of what is anthropology of life. Uh, and precisely, I think there are too many definitions of life, which uh, um, uh, runs the risk to have a very verbal approach. And the problem with many of the uh, contemporary uh, or new approaches is the fact that they pr uh, propose a, a new definition of life, precisely, but it is a verbal definition. So according to me, the project of anthropology of life is not a definition, but it is a methodology to study or to investigate. To inves Perig. investigate what? And I will give you the answer to the second and the first question. It Let's is... just do a, a, a pause for, uh, for uh, Luis to translate. Ah, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, obrigado. Uh, Ah, bom, primeiro, ele, precisamente, ele está respondendo primeiro ao Guilherme Sá, e ele diz que ele não define uma antropologia da vida, porque tem muitas definições da vida que correm o risco de serem demasiadamente verbais. E o problema de muitas abordagens é justamente que propõe uma nova definição da vida, mas essa definição permanece sendo verbal. A abordagem dele procura uh, não tratar de uma definição verbal da vida, mas sim de uma metodologia da vida, foco numa, na ideia de metodologias da vida. So precisely, the methodology uh, um, I am developing with Carlos and all the team of Carlos and with Ludovic is a methodology which attempts to uh, tackle the diversity of vernacular uh, conceptions to clarify this point. Precisely when I began my fieldwork among the Mire, I have discovered a speci specific conception of life and a lot of uh, translation issues uh, has been uh, tackled at this moment. But since the beginning, I have discovered that the conception of life, the vernacular conception of life is connected with uh, uh, technical activities and a social organization. So what I have discovered among the Mire is the fact that we deal with uh, non-biological theory, but with so sociological theories. That's why I wanted to highlight this point with Descola's book. So what I suggest is we should avoid uh, this the discussion, which would be only uh, about the translation of one concept to another one, 
on the contrary, we should investigate the diversity, the, the, the biodiversity of living beings, but also the techno diversity. And it is also something very important in the work of Carlos and all his team and, and the group of research. And we should also uh, tackle this issue uh, in relation with the diversity of social organization. So that's my answer. I mean, it is a methodology that uh, conduces to engage new investigations, avoiding a philosophical approach of life and trying to uh, establish facts and to analyze them according to uh, vernacular uh, practices and theory. Obrigado, Perric. Uh, bom, bom, tá tudo, só um minuto. Bom, a metodologia que o Perric está desenvolvendo com o Carlos, com o Ludovic, com a equipe deles, busca abordar concepções vernaculares. Então, quando ele começou o campo entre os Mihre, ele descobriu uma concepção específica da vida. E, no primeiro momento, ele lidou com questões de tradução. Mas a concepção vernacular, ele descobriu também, é ligada a atividades técnicas e organização social. Então, entre os Mirre, nós lidamos não com uma teoria biológica, mas uma teoria sociológica. Isso é que ele tentou uh, chamar a atenção ao se referir ao livro do Felipe Escolar. Então, a questão para ele não é de como traduzir um conceito da vida em outro conceito da vida, mas de explorar a diversidade, a técnica de diversidade, como no trabalho do Carlos e da equipe dele. Então, é sempre no contexto de uma metodologia. E, no contexto dessa metodologia, ele busca estabelecer fatos e analisar esses fatos em relação a ideias vernaculares. Ludovic? Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question and thanks for Luis for doing an amazing job in translating. Uh, I'm going to try to be very synthetic, so I'm going to try to give one answer to three. <laughs> I can. So first of all, the first question that was asked, I'm not really going to be able to answer because I was really directed to Perig and Perig has really answered. But basically, my, my own approach is really about understanding or outlining vernacular conception, whether they are among the Ambulé speakers or among, let's say, um, Euro-American contexts, right? And uh, the work that uh, the, 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 the Carlos team is doing is actually really important because it shows us indeed that how this idea of techno-diversity in a sense emerged from the practice the performance of technical activities and technical activities are not in themselves vernacular categories. They are really, um, they are more something that we're looking at. They are sort of ethnographic events, right? But by looking at that and looking how they interact with living being, you see the actualization. And that means not only the reproduction, but also the transformation of existing vernacular understanding of what life when we interact with living beings, but also techniques are. So if you think, for instance, at the emerging sort of a hegemony, uh, almost colonization of the concept of the Anglo, the American even, understanding of the, the concept of technology and how it moves our discourses and how we actually think about solution or means to solve certain problem, you see how this particular vernacular the dominating understanding of technology uh, is very, very important. And it is by looking at how it is actually performed, doing ethnography, that you can reveal the different, the diverse understanding of what techniques are, techniques with the senior. Sorry, Louisa, I went a bit too, um, too, too long. Go ahead. That's great. Thank you, Ludwig. I'll try my best here. Um... Então, o, o Ludovic, ele diz que a abordagem dele é sobre a compreensão e os contornos de concepções vernaculares. Tá? E ele trata isso, seja entre os falantes de Abelam, seja em outros contextos, como contextos euro-americanos. E ele diz que o trabalho do Carlos e da equipe do Carlos é muito importante, uh, porque mostra como essa ideia de, da, da, da diversidade técnica ela surge de atividades técnicas, que, portanto, são tanto categorias vernaculares quanto evento. Então, ele lida não só com reprodução, mas a transformação da interação com seres vivos. E, e esses vernaculares particulares eles são muito importantes, que eles surgem, sobretudo, pela performance, durante a etnografia. Né? E é aqui que aparece a diversidade de formas técnicas, e não a, 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 necessariamente a partir de categorias a, verbais. Né? Então, tem, tem... Yeah. 
The second part of the, of, the, of the answer, if I can go, is indeed like the idea of cosmotechnics, for example, is very interesting because it shows how um, by aligning indeed the moral order with the cosmological order or by examining how these are aligned through technical activity, you see the reproduction, but also the transformation of um, uh, modality of relation between humans and their milieu. Right? And I think that's, a, that's that particular element there uh, which uh, which is very important for anthropologists, and I'm speaking here for the angle, of course, of the anthropology of the group. É, a ideia da como a ideia de cosmotécnica é interessante porque ao alinhar a ordem a moral com a ordem cosmológica, a gente vê não só a reprodução, mas também a transformação uh, da, das, dos processos técnicos, e que isso é algo uh, regular e comum em contextos euro-americanos ou em outros contextos também. Ótimo. É, vamos, vamos então para três as três últimas questões é, começando pelo pelo Jeremi ah, vocês estão me vendo sim ok uh, então boa, boa bom dia para todo mundo um, eu queria uh, fazer uma, uma, uma questão uh, também um pouco geral porque a impressão que eu tive a escutar vocês que foi muito interessante é que a gente coloca e recoloca o técnico justamente numa posição que é central na relação que se tem com o meio dentro de um processo com, complexo de, de ações que são feitas pelos humanos, a maneira de, de agir sobre o mundo, e que vai até a Constituição, vocês já chamaram muito a atenção, sobre as concepções vernaculares, então não é de vida, mas de processos vitais que estão em jogo, e uh, uma questão que eu te, é, é como um ciclo, tá? e, e aí uma questão que eu tinha é em relação a esses, uh, esses momentos, essas relações sociais que estão um pouco em cadeia, como essa aparece aqui, teria uh, como pensar justamente a momentos, o dimensões, momentos não, dimensões que eu chamaria mais de jogo, de jogo no sentido que as agências em jogo para utilizar o termo perigo, agência, elas têm um, é, elas têm um diálogo constante. Ou seja, eu, eu trabalho com animais, então para mim faz talvez sentido demais, mas tem um, tem um momento sempre que o, a percepção, a, a experimentação com o que o outro é capaz de fazer, nesse sentido, é uma dimensão de jogo que é uma dimensão que cujo fluxo não é determinado, é nenhuma direção, é isso que eu queria fazer dizer e como que vocês pensam se você pensam isso dentro da constituição do vernacular que ao mesmo tempo depois vai ser fundamental para orientar as ações que vão dar essas experiências Esse, sim. Tá? desculpe Luiz Jeremy Jeremy okay he has a general question he says he has the impression uh, that we uh, is everybody listening to me okay can you hear me yes I have the impression that we put uh, that when we put the technical as central to our relations with the milieu uh, uh, and, and, and central to acts on the world, uh, which and, and we take this all the way up until the vernacular conceptions of life and vital processes. And given this, he has a question, which is in relation to these moments, these social relations uh, thought of as sequences. Can we also think of moments and dimensions that he, he would call games? Because the agency of games are in, in constant dialogue and he works with animals. So this makes sense to him. They're in constant dialogue with, with experimentation and what, with what the other can do. And the flux is therefore not determined in any direction. And he was wondering if you think that uh, uh, this uh, uh, possibility of games in terms of the construction of the vernacular and, and how this, this vernacular then guides the way that the acts are, are, are put into practice. If I understood you correctly, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, Perig and Ludovic, we will now hear the last two questions and then uh, we will give the, the, the floor back to you. Uh, so, uh, Fabio? Fabio? Sim. Ah, agora sim. Estamos te ouvindo, vivendo. Okay. Uh, Fabio, se você. Uh, na medida, isso é um pouco para todo mundo. Se você se alongar um pouco, faz uma pausa no meio para que o, o Luiz possa traduzir de forma mais concisa. Né? Eu acho que temos tido perguntas um pouco longas, aí fica mais difícil dele, dele traduzir. Mas vamos lá. Eu também, com, com meu sotaque, também não vai ser muito fácil. Não, tá <risos> tá <simples. certo. risos> 
Bom dia para todas e todos. Eu queria, em primeiro lugar, agradecer por estar aqui novamente discutindo essas questões, rever aí o Ludovic e conhecer o Perigo. Né? É, acho que foram muito interessantes, extremamente interessantes as duas conferências e eu vou é, é, tentar fazer, é, colocar as minhas colocações a partir é, da fala do, do Ludovic, mas de alguma maneira se estende também as colocações do PEDIG, né? Vou partir da, do esquema que o Ludovic ele nos apresenta é, triangula, nessa triangulação entre sistemas técnicos, objetos técnicos e sistemas de atividades, né? É, eu é, queria, a minha pergunta, de fato, seria em que medida esse sistema técnico que embute, né, entre parênteses, como o Ludovic coloca, né, aspectos sociopolíticos, eles não poderiam ser, de alguma maneira, é, é, coestendidos é, para é, essa é, outra ponta do triângulo, que seria o sistema de, de atividades, que teria depois como consequência a definição dos objetos técnicos. Por que estou dizendo isso? Porque é, a impressão que temos dentro da literatura, geralmente, é que quando se fala de social e de político, não se coloca como algo externo ao processo técnico, e não como algo constitutivo desse processo. Tá? E hum, eu venho trabalhando com a ideia de que a política é técnica, e, portanto, não seria uma uma técnica, uma tecnopolítica, já é como se fossem duas coisas, já é a própria política como técnica que permite justamente de gerenciar, administrar essas relações tá? e é, que ocorrem, inclusive, nesse caso específico, entre humanos, humanos em processos vitais. Então, a pergunta é em que medida, uh, para a própria definição das cadeias operatórias, como o, 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 o Ludovic coloca, é, e para a própria definição, muito bem acertada, não, é, é, de um transecto, né, de um algo heterogêneo e complexo, essas intencionalidades políticas não podiam ser vistas como constitutivas desses processos, nessas descrições, né? é, nas relações com as entidades no cosmo, nas relações com o Inhame, e etc. E não vistas como um paradigma externo né, de gerenciamento é, é, através de uma visão mais holística. Né? É isso. Ok, um, Fábio Moura, da Universidade de Paraíba. Uh, uh, Sim, desculpa. <laughs> he wants to, to uh, place. Uh, basically, his, his question is based on Ludovic's presentation, but it also bears on Perig's talk. And he wants to start from the Ludovic's triangulation between uh, technical objects, technical systems, and and activities. I think, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in what way, Fabio asks, is this technical system in its socio-political aspects? Could it not in some way also be extended to uh, the other tip of the triangle, uh, activities and technical objects? Because he finds that typically in the, in the, in the literature, social and political uh, aspects are seen to be external to technical processes rather than internal to them or an, an, uh, an aspect of them. So he has been thinking of the political as techniques, politics as techniques, a, tec a technique that administers these, uh, uh, these ways of, for example, of, of, of these operational sequences, for example, Uh, and, for, and, and these heterogeneous complexes of different, of different uh, activities and, and objects and so forth. So his question is whether politics cannot be seen to be integral to these processes rather than something that is somehow external to them. Thank you, Luis. Uh, now we hear the last question. Uh, Viviane? Obrigada, Carlos. Está um, todo mundo me ouvindo? Tudo Sim. certo? É, bom dia a todos. Eu gostaria, antes de mais nada, de parabenizar a organização do evento e também cumprimentar os palestrantes pela, pelas palestras, pelas falas, que foram muito instigantes. E a, a, meu nome é Viviane, eu sou professora da UFSC, para facilitar aí as apresentações. É, a, a minha pergunta é muito rápida, né? muito simples. O professor Ludovic falou a respeito da diferença né, da relação entre meio e ambiente, 
e pontuou uma preferência pela ideia de meio ao invés de ambiente, e eu fiquei, gostaria, se fosse possível, de que ele aprofundasse um pouco essa discussão, pensando talvez a relação do espaço, né, e pensando o espaço como algo também feito pelo, por esses processos técnicos que estão sendo, enfim, estudados, elaborados aqui, né, então é isso, né, essa relação entre meio e ambiente, que, que é, seria a minha pergunta. Obrigada. So, uh, Diane, uh, apologies, of, of the University of Santa Catarina. Uh, thanks to the organizers and the speakers for the wonderful talks. And uh, she's, uh, her question is directed to Ludovic, who speaks of the difference between uh, milieu and environment. And, uh, and, uh, prefer, and says he prefers, or, or in his words, to use the idea of milieu over that of environment. And she would ask Ludovic to prolong this reflection and to think, uh, including a Uh, 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 the aspect of space as something that is produced by these technical processes, whether uh, um, whether that bears on the distinction between milieu and environment, the idea of space in relation to technical processes. Uh, uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Ludovic Pirib to add uh, the final comments to the responses, uh, and then uh, bom, eu vou adicionar aqui um comentário para o Ludovic e o Pirib já adicionarem os seus Uh, comentários finais, as respostas que vão fazer agora, a gente se encaminha para o encerramento da sessão. Perique? Uh, maybe Ludovic can uh, his, uh, Ok, Ludovic. So, Ludovic? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, to Vivian, Fabio, and Jeremy. So, a lot of stuff there. Very amazing question. Thank you very much. I mean, games, I mean, you know, there is the anthropology of game, there is game theory within anthropology. We can talk about that quite long. And indeed, I haven't really thought about including that within my, my current thinking. Uh, what I sort of remember from my uh, investigation of game theory from some time ago was the relationship between Uh, indeed, the unpredictability, but also the existence of norms that sets up the space for the game, but also the fact, and I've got a colleague who did that for um, role-playing games and etc., and board games and creating a sort of cos microcosmos, right? Uh, game frame and microcosmos. So, Jeremy, I'm sorry, I don't have really an answer there, but I think that you're touching upon something which is quite interesting, which is indeed the relation between the sort of uh, the set of rules and the unpredictability, right? So... Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to there. I'm sorry I can't answer without uh, going more into that. Uh, Fabio's question, yes, of course, that's the triangle. Oh, sorry, uh, Luis, do you want to answer to Jeremy first? That would be great, Ludovic. Bom, eu agradeço as perguntas do Fabio, do Jeremy e da Viviane, que são ótimas, tem muita coisa, são ótimas perguntas. Em relação à pergunta do Jeremy, a questão dos jogos, da antropologia dos jogos, da teoria dos jogos, ele diz que não tem pensado muito sobre isso na sua pesquisa. O que ele se lembra da teoria dos jogos é justamente essa relação entre as regras e a imprevisibilidade. E como diferentes uhum. tipos de jogos, ele fala dos jogos de tabuleiro, aqueles jogos de RPG, etc., eles criam um microcosmo também, uh, com as suas próprias regras e suas próprias imprevisibilidades. Então, ele não tem uma resposta exatamente para o que o Jeremy coloca, mas ele acha que parece fundamental, que, de fato, o Jeremy está tocando no ponto uhum. fundamental sobre a relação entre um conjunto de regras e a imprevisibilidade. Yeah, thanks. And also remember something about game theory, talking about zero sum, so in a sort of very economic way. So that's not really my cup of tea there. Okay. Um, Fabio, um, question absolutely amazing. Yes, indeed, the triangle that I, that I put is really a methodological one, and the term system doesn't really satisfy me, uh, nor does the, the, the notion of network meetup, which has been criticizing itself. So basically, the starting point is for me, technical relations, even at the level of the technical action on a specific material, right, is already social relations in other form. So of course the political and the social is already existing at every single level. And we all know from STS that, you know, technical objects are themselves imbued with and you know, particularly an autonomous object, emerge out of social technical relation, the entire STS, the Scott, and etc. So I'm not trying to separate them or create an ontological separation, although arguably, and that's where I am at this moment, I don't think we can see technical systems, but we can see technical action and we can see technical objects. So system in themselves, we cannot apprehend them 
directly when we follow the shell operatoire, we are indeed crossing a universe or several paths or elements of manifestation of other form of relation, but you don't never see the entire relation in itself, right? When I make a cup of tea, I turn on the, the kettle, I activate the energy grid. I don't see the entire energy grid, right? Or I put water on. So, but in the, the way in which I choose to use a kettle instead of using a saucepan and, a, and you know, the stove, is already, there is here already a social political action or choice. So that's my answer to that. So the idea that those networks, those mesh work, those systems are there, they are there, they might emerge from the relations uh, between technical activity and technical action. That leads me to Vivian's question. Thank you very much for that. The notion of media, which comes indeed from, you know, uh, broad range of sources that, you know, Carlos and his team is already using, such as uh, Simon Don, Canguilhem, Leroy Gouran, right? With this idea of a milieu that is sort of in which beings are bathed and are in relation with. So there is here something which is, that's the reason why I prefer that, that the idea of environment that seems always somehow like a, a, a layer. Oh, Luis, do you want to answer first to, to Fabio, perhaps? Go ahead, I'll go back to milieu. I'll try to answer uh, uh, Fábio first. Então, em relação à pergunta do Fábio, que ele achou ótima, excelente pergunta, ele diz que o triângulo que ele desenvolveu é metodológico, e nem tudo ali o satisfaz exatamente, quer dizer, tem, ele, ele entende que tem lacunas ali. E o ponto de partida dele, no entanto, são relações técnicas, ações técnicas, que são, evidentemente, relações sociais. Então, claro que para ele, política e social já existem em todo momento. Né, os estudos de ciência, por exemplo, mostraram para a gente que objetos técnicos eles emergem de relações sociopolíticas. Então, a ideia não é criar uma separação ontológica entre política, sociedade e processos técnicos. No entanto, ele diz que nós não podemos ver objetos, nós podemos ver objetos técnicos, mas não as técnicas. Ele pega o exemplo de quando ele vai fazer chá, ele liga, ele, ele prepara a bulha, a chaleira, e, e, e isso são escolhas, ele pode ver esses momentos, mas ele não vê a sequência inteira. Mas esses eventos são, essas escolhas, as escolhas de usar uma chaleira ou bulha, elas são escolhas, escolhas políticas, diretamente. Então, a sequência, a, a chana operatoire, né, a sequência operatória, ela segue eventos sem ver tudo. São atos sequenciais no qual você não vê o todo. Mas o modo como, mas, mas claro que todas as escolhas são atos sociopolíticos. Já as redes, as mechas, elas estão lá, elas podem emergir da relação entre atividades técnicas e políticas. Thank you. Uh, and so the idea of milieu, yeah, yeah. So as I was saying, so I, I trace back it's sort of uh, the way in which I think about it. But I think that what I found interesting is the fact that the relation between technical activities and technical objects and what it makes emerge, and including whether living beings or not living beings and vital processes or not uh, vital processes, create a space. I mean, techniques are time and space creating, but they also milieu creating, they generate the milieu, they enroll it. So, you know, such as my computer produces a heat, right? And the yam, right, grows and, you know, uh, help or, or, or uh, interact with the, the, the cultivator to, you know, so that you can build the trellis. And so the trellis and the plants are co-constructed one another. And that creates an entire milieu that creates indeed a form of ecosystem or techno ecosystem. And I think that's a very um, uh, important element because if we start thinking like that, then as uh, Carlos is, uh, and his team is starting to, to, to delineate, we can think about uh, the relationship between techno diversity and biodiversity and the diversity of environments or milieu they generate and in which they are immersing. Thank you. Yeah, I will make some final comments. Uh, ah, also reading, uh, uh, Luis, you want to translate? Uh, yeah, uh, just sorry. a second. <laughs> do Ludovic, enfim, ele prefere o milieu porque dá essa ideia de onde os seres se relacionam, enquanto o ambiente para ele parece sempre ser uma camada, digamos. E ele diz que o milieu é interessante porque a relação entre objetos e atividades, elas emergem, os processos vitais surgem e criam um espaço, evidentemente. Então, técnicas são criadoras de espaço e de tempo e do meio. E claro que a uh, um, é produto, né? ele fala do yame, né? o yame interage com o calor que é produzido, 
uh, que interage também com o cultivador, com a treliça, e um co-constrói o outro nesse espaço. A gente vê essa dimensão de um espaço ali. Isso é um elemento importante, então, que ele acho que delineia essa relação entre a técnica de diversidade e as diversidades dos meios uh, dos quais, nos quais as técnicas surgem e que são criadas pelas técnicas. Okay. No. <laughs> no, I wanted to, to make some final comments also uh, reading some of the, of the uh, uh, some elements of the chat uh, just to, to make a, a cl clarification uh, the word methods or methodology is not at all an application of uh, a biological methodology obviously it is just a research program to uh, an ethnographic and anthropological research program in order to evaluate several theoretical propositions. So it is not the moment here, but I could, uh, for me, the methodology is just a way to articulate uh, empirical data and conceptualization, and uh, uh, in order to organize the field I have uh, presented at the beginning in the second slide. The second point very important is precisely uh, we should avoid uh, in anthropology the conflation with a biological concept. That's why I say that the, the object of uh, biology is not the same object as uh, the object of anthropology of life. So we should avoid biocentrism. That, that means to say we should avoid the fact that just observing living beings. That's why my contention is precisely Uh, uh, an anthropological uh, investigation should, should be able to either uh, observe living beings or interactions with them or material culture or institutions. So it is really a comparative ethnographical model that uh, we are developing with Ludovic and Carlos and the three teams of research we've got in uh, three parts of the world. So I think the, the contribution of uh, 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 Brazilian anthropology on this uh, topic is crucial. So uh, it's really a, a great apportation, a great contribution to have the possibility to, to share insights on this topic and to avoid uh, philosophical use of uh, the word life. So my, uh, I mean, there is two uh, risks with uh, the use of the word life. The risk is to put too much of the Western biological conceptualization, or it is to inject too much philosophical uh, uh, speculations. So, uh, and last but not least, just to make a very clear uh, clarification, my project as uh, Salins or Descola is a strong project against any kind of uh, cultural ecology or socio-biological uh, bi bi explanation. I don't think that the society is going to develop itself from the interaction with life. On the contrary, I, co I consider that life is a concept under construction. And uh, the object of anthropology is to observe the intersection between living beings, and maybe we should define what is a living being, obviously, but there are certain phenomena which appears in all the societies, and uh, anthropology should uh, articulate this observation with uh, observation of technique and uh, social organization. So it is really uh, a clear fight against any uh, attempt of reductionism of cultural system uh, with a, cultural, a natural system. You, Can I just add something just on to that? Yes. To the last, uh, what Pirik, just what uh, Pirik said about life is valid for technology, and wait. part, but it, it might be even more crucial because technology is not techniques, right? Technology is a is a modern category. And just one last uh, sentence: when you say we are uh, in war against uh, a virus against coronavirus. If you, it is also a vernacular uh, conceptualization of life, which is Yeah, Pierre okay. was cut, but I can, you, you can see what he wants to say there, right? I yeah. think about the vernacular, yeah. Maybe. 
ok? Acho que vamos passar para o Luiz, né? enquanto o Perig retoma a conexão, né? Ah, tá, então o Perig... Você está jogando! Ele Três comentários finais, né, que é para clarificar também em função muito do que está sendo dito no chat que ele está acompanhando. Tá? primeira coisa é que a palavra metodologia ela não busca ser uma aplicação, uh, digamos, das da ciências naturais ou da biologia. Né? Na verdade, é um programa de pesquisa antropológica que busca avaliar proposições teóricas diversas. Tá? Então, a ideia de metodologia, para ele, é um meio de se articular dados empíricos para organizar o campo. Seu segundo ponto que é relacionado a esse é evitar, que é muito importante na antropologia, a gente evitar, evitar uma confusão, uma confusão né, entre conceitos biológicos uh, e a antropologia da vida. Tá? Uh, a antropologia da vida e a biologia não têm o mesmo objeto. Então, a meta dele sempre foi evitar o biocentrismo, uh, a ideia de que basta observar seres vivos. A investigação antropológica, para ele, deve observar cultura material, atos práticos e instituições sociais também. E o que eles buscam é uma metodologia antropológica. E ele fala aqui que a contribuição da antropologia brasileira é crucial e que essa é uma oportunidade ímpar né, desse momento, desse diálogo. Então, ele diz que, na verdade, tem dois riscos né, quando a gente usa a palavra vida na antropologia. O primeiro risco é justamente esse que ele falou, que é, 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 é de certa forma, a, a, a trafegar para dentro da discussão a concepção ocidental da biológica da vida. O outro também é injetar um excesso de especulação filosófica, que também é uma questão que ele uh, acha que, que, que é, é problemática. Ele tem, o projeto dele é realmente antropológico, ele está fortemente ligado à etnografia, e essas são duas armadilhas que, acho que ele, ele, ele acha que a gente tem que uh, evitar. E, por fim, uh, o projeto dele, do Perique, uh, é, é e aqui, isso aqui ele quis com, com a referência ao Felipe Descolar, é um projeto especificamente contra a ecologia cultural ou a sociobiologia. Tá? Para ele, a sociedade não se desenvolve da interação da vida. É a vida que é um conceito sob construção. E cabe à antropologia investigar a interação entre seres vivos. Claro, a gente pode se perguntar também o que é seres vivos. Isso é uma pergunta etnográfica válida. Mas a interação entre seres vivos, seja como for definido, com observações de técnicas e organização social. Então, o projeto dele é uma luta clara contra o reducionismo, a redução de sistemas culturais a sistemas naturais. Tá, e o Ludovic chama atenção também para a ideia de que tecnologias não são técnicas, né? que tecnologia é uma categoria uh, moderna, e que isso é importante, uma distinção que ele considera importante também. Por fim, o Perig, antes de estar cortado, se eu entendi, ele está dizendo que quando o, o Carlos abre a, a conferência com a, a ideia de uma guerra contra o vírus, ele também está expressando uma concepção vernacular da vida uh, e das técnicas no entorno uh, uh, da vida. Uh, da vida. A, acho que é isso, não sei se eu perdi alguma coisa. Super, Luiz. Super obrigado. All these uh, wonderful translations, Luiz, it was very uh, precise. Thank you very much. Oh, thank yeah, you. Thanks, Luiz. Amazing work. <laughs> obrigado. Obrigado ao Ludovic, ao, ao Perig, né, pelas conferências excelentes, né, e o debate é, super rico que se desenrolou a partir delas. A gente buscou fazer essa conexão né, bilíngue para poder dar acesso a múltiplos públicos, né? e isso uh, nos leva a fazer um agradecimento especial ao Luiz Costa pelo maravilhoso trabalho de tradução de, e de compreensão antropológica dos debates aí que, que possibilitou esse, esse diálogo bilíngue. Né? Então, foi uma belíssima abertura para o seminário, é, com etnografia, com vários elementos e questões teóricas e metodológicas sobre o nosso tema. Né? Boa parte delas, enfim, serão discutidas nos próximos dias. É, e aí, no meu comentário final, é, eu, pra, antes de, de encerrar, eu queria lembrá-los, então, que temos até quinta, a programação está bastante divulgada. Hoje à tarde teremos, às 15 horas, uma sessão de trabalho intitulada A Vida Vegetal e Seus Modos de Ação. Então, todos convidados no Zoom. Luis, uh, acho que seria yeah. interessante ser, né? Ludovic Perry, it was a pleasure. Great seeing both of you. And, yeah, uh, I know. Uh, um, yeah. Same. Thank you very much. Então, Goodbye. Thanks to uh, all uh, the organizers. Take care, guys. Thank you. Uh, obrigado a todos. E nos vemos, então, na continuidade do evento, nas próximas conferências e nas sessões de trabalho. Um abraço a todos. Tchau, tchau. Obrigado.